When the Court of Appeal adjourned for the day at four, the Crown was in the midst of an appeal against an acquittal entered by our next speaker. And I am scheduled tomorrow morning to respond to the Crown, so it gives me a rare opportunity to introduce someone who's virtually a client. <laughs> our, next, our next topic is self-defense and the defense of property. Our speaker, His Honor, Judge Langdon. This is about the uh, meanest jury I've ever faced. If, uh, if it were open to me, I think I would plead and cast myself on the mercy of the court. Now, the paper that you will be getting uh, on this subject uh, with the material runs something in excess of 50 pages, which I can't possibly cover in 40 minutes. I don't know whether that's because I have never learned economy of language or because when you're number three, you try harder. <laughs> However, um, I'm going to try to skim over and touch the high points. I may make certain statements for which I won't produce any authority here. I hope it's in the paper. My uh, task, as I was instructed, was to go over this entire area in the last five years and just touch on whatever may be new or different so that I have not had a complete comprehensive presentation of any one thing, but rather a basket containing a number of things which I hope will be useful to you. The main and principal one is um, to which I've devoted about half the paper and about half my time tonight, I trust, is the rather thorny issue about the use of excessive force in self-defense, where death results is murder reduced to manslaughter. In other words, does excessive force in self-defense have the same effect as provocation when that force results in the death of the victim? Now, the House of Lords has canvassed that issue, and I'll state the issue as they delineate it uh, on a case coming out of Jamaica. Uh, they said, there is no room for criticism of the summing up unless there is a rule that in every case where the issue of self-defense is left to the jury, they must be directed that if they consider that excessive force was used in defense, then they should return a verdict of manslaughter. Now, the House of Lords decided that there was no such rule. I agree with them. That, of course, is usually a guarantee that the Court of Appeal will view the matter otherwise. However, there is a rapidly and uh, sub rapidly developing and substantial body of case law in Canada, especially in the recent cases out of Alberta in the Court of Appeal called Fraser and G, that suggest that there is such a doctrine, and those cases purport to import into Canadian law uh, certain Australian decisions which also disagree with the House of Lords. I will attempt to demonstrate to you that I think the doctrine is a snare and a delusion. It's been ad accurately characterized by the House of Lords as a fanciful hypothesis. It's a misnomer, a likely false kindness, and is the result of fuzzy thinking. I'll take as a safe point of departure the case of Baxter and Bo cases of Baxter and Bogue in the Ontario Court of Appeal. They are about five or six years old. They have been cited in almost every appellate court in Canada and have been universally accepted as a correct interpretation of Section 34 of the Criminal Code. So I'm going to consider that Baxter and Bogue have settled basic principles beyond dispute. I have attempted uh, to place the results of those two decisions in the form of a checklist of questions, which has been passed out, I hope, that if asked and answered, will determine, within the meaning of Baxter and Bogue, whether the defense of self-defense is available to your client. Before getting into that checklist, I think it would be useful to state for you the Australian common law rule, which has been adopted by Fraser and G in Alberta, 
and in other provinces. These statements are not comprehensive. There are other statements of them, but I'll give you a couple uh, so that you can focus in on it. Um, Justice Moyer of the Alberta Court of Appeal in Fraser said that the underlying rationale of the Howe case in Australia is to be found in a conviction that the moral culpability of a person who kills another in defending himself but who fails in a plea of self-defense only because the force which he believed to be necessary exceeded that which was reasonably necessary falls short of the moral culpability ordinarily associated with murder. In the decision of G, same judge uh, stated that there are certain conditions under which the defense may be raised, and I say defense, it's a qualified defense because it only operates to reduce murder to manslaughter. He said, one, certain serious circumstances existed which led the accused to reasonably believe the situation involving danger existed. Two, the accused used unreasonable or excessive force. Three, the accused was acting honestly when he used excessive force in that he mistakenly believed that the degree of force that he was using was reasonable. There are other statements of the doctrine in the material. I would ask you to note as a starting point the absence, the total absence of any reference in any of those statements to the provisions of the Criminal Code of Canada or to the tests which the Criminal Code suggest. Uh, as I read those cases, I wondered if the Court of Appeal was perhaps leading Premier Lougheed in a departure from Confederation and reference to the Criminal Code. In any event, uh, if you can turn to the checklist, I'll just, I have attempted in the checklist to paraphrase sections 34, subsections 1 and 2 by asking a number of questions. The first question is, was the accused unlawfully assaulted? And that should be unlawfully, notwithstanding what the sheet says. And, or did he reasonably but mistakenly believe that he was assaulted? Because he has the benefit of the doctrine of mistake of fact really at any stage of the defense. But in order to come within sections 34.1 and 34.2, he has to establish he was unlawfully assaulted. Secondly, did he provoke the assault upon himself? If he did, then you go to section 35, which I'm not really dealing with tonight. If he did not provoke the assault on himself, you proceed to the third element in the test. Was the force used by the accused in repelling the assault intended to cause death or grievous bodily harm? Please note that the critical issue is not the result of the force, but the intention with which the force was applied by the accused. Now, this issue is not specifically addressed in any of the statements of the Australian tests, and it therefore makes it very difficult to import those tests into the Canadian Criminal Code. The answer to question three, however, whether the force used was intended to cause death or grievous bodily harm is a dividing point. If that force was not intended to cause death or grievous bodily harm, then one proceeds with section 34.1. If the force the accused used in defending himself was intended to cause death or grievous bodily harm, then you must jump to section 34.2. That, I think, is a plain and fair interpretation of what the Court of Appeal said in Baxter. To stay within section 34.1, therefore, we conclude that the jury has at least been in doubt that the accused uh, intended to cause death or grievous bodily harm. Or, to state it colloquially, we find that he did not intend to cause death or grievous bodily harm. Then question four is asked. And this is the only place in the entire code where these words are used, where the question of excessive force arises. And the question is, did the accused use more force than was necessary to enable him to defend himself? Now, if he did not, he has succeeded in his defense and he is acquitted. If he did, then according to the House of Lords and Palmer, self-defense is eliminated from the case. Any other defense still open 
on the merits of the case is still available to the accused. Now, if we find that the accused got as far as question four, but that he used more force than was necessary, we go back to question three, because to get to question four, we've had to answer that favorably to the accused, and we find, therefore, that although he used excessive force, he did not intend to cause death or grievous bodily harm. Now, we are dealing in this situation, that these cases uh, raise, only uh, with situations where death results. If self-defense is a legitimate issue, the only intent that could be found that would lead to murder as a verdict is specified in section 212A2. That is, where the accused means to cause death or means to cause bodily harm that he knows is likely to cause death and is reckless whether death ensues or not. I ask you to compare the two intents, the one in section 34.1 and the one in section 212A2. If question three, the test under 34.1, is answered no, I would suggest to you that it would be impossible to answer that the intent for murder, as specified in 212A2, could be answered unfavorably to the accused. In other words, if you find that he did not intend to cause death or grievous bodily harm, it is not really open then to a jury to conclude that he meant to cause death or meant to cause bodily harm that he knew would likely cause death and was reckless whether death ensued or not. Therefore, either the death under section 34.1, which was, was an accident, and if it was an accident, then according to Baxter, it's non-culpable and there's an acquittal, or the death was the result of excessive force, but force which was not intended to cause death, and under section 26, the accused being authorized to use force but using excessive force is criminally responsible for the excess. In other words, he caused the death by an unlawful act, and that is manslaughter. But I suggest that it is fuzzy thinking to go on from that conclusion and say that if death results from excessive force and self-defense, murder is automatically reduced to manslaughter. That is too big a jump. I suggest when you could get on to Fraser and G, which are decided under section 34, subsection 2, you have to bear in mind that a proper analysis is that excessive force is relevant only in deciding whether section 34, 1 is applicable, where the accused did not intend to cause death or grievous bodily harm. If he uses excessive force, the verdict may be manslaughter. It is almost impossible, I suggest, to conceive of a guilty verdict for murder because the intents under 34.1 and 212A2 simply are a mismatch. So much for section 34.1. The critical question which divides section 34.1 from subsection 2 is question 3 in my checklist. Again, was the force used by the accused in repelling the assault intended to cause death or grievous bodily harm? If it was so intended, one goes to 34.2, and section 34, subsection 2, defines those circumstances in which the deliberate causing of death or grievous bodily harm is nonetheless justified. Now, I have put those questions out as 5A and B and 6A and B, because each of the two questions has a subjective and an objective element. So that in question 5A, the first question that must be answered in determining whether section 34.2 justifies the deliberate infliction of death or grievous bodily harm is, did the accused apprehend, that is, genuinely, subjectively, that he would suffer death or grievous bodily harm from the unlawful assault upon himself? If he didn't, that's the end of the defense. He didn't believe he was in danger, he can't intentionally inflict death or grievous bodily harm. However, his apprehension must be reasonable, that is, reasonable when judged objectively. 
The second branch of the test in section 34.2, which I put in at question 6A, did the accused believe genuinely and subjectively that he could not otherwise preserve himself from death or grievous bodily harm? Of course, he has to have the genuine belief. If he didn't, then he's not entitled to kill anybody. And finally, if he has the belief, was it based on reasonable and probable grounds? I don't know whether the addition of the word probable adds anything more to reasonable, but it's in there for whatever argument you may wish to address to it. However, if he believes that he has no other way to defend himself, and if his belief objectively viewed as reasonable, or if a jury's in doubt about it, then he will be acquitted. And he will be acquitted even though that belief or any belief be mistaken. All the way down the line, he's entitled to the benefit of the defensive mistake of fact. Now, the important thing that you have to have in mind, I think, when you try to grapple with these cases of Fraser and G, is that when you're talking about Section 34.2, where you have deliberately caused death or grievous harm, there is no room to talk about the use of excessive force. Death has resulted. There can't be any more excessive force than that which causes the death. So that what you're really talking about, if you analyze the defense carefully, is not the degree of force, but rather whether the accused's beliefs were reasonable. That is, the issue is, were the accused's beliefs reasonable when viewed objectively. Now, if those beliefs are reasonable, the accused's killing of the victim in self-defense is justified and the verdict is acquittal. If not, according to the House of Lords in Palmer and according also to the Manitoba Court of Appeal in Appleby, self-defense is simply not available. Nevertheless, any other defense available on the merits of the case is still open. We look again to the intent that has been established under the answer to question three. We have found when we get as far as subsection 34.2 that the accused intended to cause death or grievous bodily harm. But we found that his beliefs either did not exist or were not supported by reasonable grounds. Does that intent meet the test in section 212A2? Well, I suggest to you that it probably does. The wording is not the same, but if you intend to cause death or grievous bodily harm, then probably you're going to meet the test that you intended bodily harm that you know is likely to cause death and were reckless whether death ensued or not. Therefore, the likely verdict will be murder in the second degree. And why not? After all, the accused deliberately caused death. And I suggest to you that if he had no reasonable grounds for believing himself in jeopardy or for believing he had no other way to defend himself, murder is the proper verdict. However, if he for some reason does not meet the intention specified in 212A2, that is, if it requires more than merely intending death or grievous bodily harm, still a manslaughter verdict is possibly open. The more likely verdict, I would think, would be second-degree murder. If there is a difference in the intention between that required in question three on your checklist and that required in 212A2, it's a matter of nice debate, such as uh, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It's not likely, I suggest to you, to occur in a jury room. Now, where the really difficult issue has arisen in Fraser and G is that those cases suggest that if the accused has the genuine beliefs that I have referred to, that is, the belief that he's in imminent peril of death or grievous bodily harm and that he has no other way to defend himself, but if his beliefs are nonetheless unreasonable as viewed by the jury, then the proper verdict should always be manslaughter. Now, this is where Fraser and G bring into Canada this Australian doctrine that the House of Lords has rejected. I suggest to you that that importation is wrong and for a, a vast number of reasons. First of all, there's a policy consideration. 
This is one that doesn't come out of any cases. I made this one up, so I'm ad-libbing here. But in my view, Section 34 and the other sections of the Code authorizing the use of force by an accused is in its object to provide a balance between the rights of a person who is in fear and the rights or concern for life or bodily safety of him who becomes the victim. Under Baxter and Bogue, the defender or accused will be excused even if he deliberately inflicts death or grievous harm, provided he has two beliefs that I've dealt with and that those beliefs are reasonable. First, as a matter of policy, is not the life of the victim, even one who unlawfully assaults the accused, worth this much, that he who would kill him should have at least reasonable grounds for the beliefs which he uses to justify that killing? If you wish to debate that further, there are references to uh, English articles in the Criminal Law Review where that issue has arisen in England, and um, I think you will find that policy question is a very difficult one to answer if you follow the Fraser and G line of thinking. Um, also, under sections 25, subsection 1 and 3, those sections under the self-defense or general defense provisions of the code that justify the use of force, say, by a police officer, they uniformly require the police officer, when he's causing death or grievous bodily harm, to act on reasonable and probable grounds. Well, if your local policeman has to have reasonable and probable grounds for killing somebody in public defense, it doesn't seem reasonable to me to suggest that your private individual uh, should have a greater shield under the provisions under Section 34.1 and Section 34 sub 2. Third, I suggest that it's another angel on the head of a pin debate, a real, true, metaphysical question that a jury will ever have to face the issue that the accused beliefs were, according to their finding, genuine and yet unsupported by reasonable grounds. Let us put that debate in the context in which it will occur in the jury room. First of all, if his beliefs are genuine and reasonable, they may still be mistaken, but they will still operate for the purposes of the defense. Secondly, before the jury get to the jury room, they are going to be told that the accused, when confronted with an uplifted knife, does not have to weigh his retaliatory force to a nicety. There's no necessity for him to weigh with jeweler's scales what he does. He's confronted with an emergency and he reacts. And the jury must be instructed accordingly. There is no duty under 34.1, although there is under, or 2, although there is under 35, to retreat. Retreat may be a factor in determining the reasonableness of his conduct, but he doesn't have to retreat. And finally, the onus is always on the Crown to prove that the accused did not act in self-defense. And if, on the whole of the evidence, there is any reasonable doubt whatever about whether the accused acted in self-defense, that's to be resolved in his favor. Now, I suggest to you that given all those additional protections, is it really ever very likely going to occur that a jury will be able to conclude that his two beliefs were genuine, beyond a re but beyond a reasonable doubt, not based on reasonable and probable grounds. I think uh, that that is so unlikely to happen that it's not worthy of the importation of Australian common law, whatever it is, into Canada. I would compare this result, which I think is a logical result of Fraser and G, to the statement of the House of Lords in Palmer, The House of Lords there said, if the jury are satisfied by the prosecution that the accused did not act in self-defense and was not provoked, then the jury will have to decide whether the accused had the intent that is necessary if the crime of murder is to be proved. If on the evidence in a case the view is possible that though all questions of self-defense and of provocation are rejected by the jury, it would be open to them to conclude that although he acted unjustifiably, he had no intent to kill or cause serious bodily injury, 
then manslaughter should be left to the jury. But it is not every fanciful hypothesis that need be presented for their consideration. Also, the same court and the same decision states, but in many cases where someone is intending to defend himself, he will have an intention to cause serious bodily injury or even to kill. And if the prosecution satisfy the jury that he had one of those intentions in circumstances in which, or at a time when there was no justification or excuse for having it, then the prosecution will have shown that the question of self-defense is eliminated. All other issues, which on the facts may arise, will be unaffected. An issue of self-defense may, of course, arise in a range and variety of cases and circumstances where no death has resulted. The test as to its rejection or its validity will be just the same as in a case where death has resulted. Now, this is another anomaly to this doctrine that the Alberta Court of Appeal would have us adopt. They say that if you're acting in self-defense but excessively and you kill somebody, then murder becomes manslaughter. But it doesn't go any farther than that. And the House of Lords in that statement, I think, have pointed up another issue, which uh, I have uh, dealt with on, as items 9 and 10 in the checklist, which I pointed out to you. If the qualified defense theory is good legal theory or even good policy, then surely it will not be long before the argument will be made that if intentional killing in self-defense without reasonable grounds is truly less morally culpable and serves to reduce murder to manslaughter, then in cases where only grievous bodily harm results and the accused, for instance, is charged with wounding, and the jury finds his de self-defense was excessive, well then, why not reduce wounding to assault causing bodily harm? Follows, it's less morally culpable. And if he's charged with ABH, well then let's reduce that to common assault. And if he's charged with common assault, reductio ad absurdum. Eventually, a whole new qualified defense will arise known as unreasonable mistake of fact. And the effect of that will generally be to result in a conviction of the next most serious included offense. One may reasonably predict a plethora of subjectively genuine, naturally, but wholly unreasonable mistakes of fact, a great tool in plea negotiation, a veritable warehouse of objections to charges to the jury, and not to mention a whole challenge to the ingenuity of the accused. I think that the uh, logically analyzed, the path down which this Fraser and G doctrine leads us is fraught with thorns and barbs and really uh, isn't good law at all. Finally, uh, I would ask you to look at item eight in the checklist. If I'm right about what I've said about Section 34.2, it is obvious that the name by which this qualified defense is known, that is, the use of excessive force in self-defense, is a misnomer, is misleading, and probably accounts for fuzzy thinking in this area. It is only available in areas which deal not with excessive force, but with erroneous beliefs, that is, unreasonable grounds for beliefs. A more appropriate name for the defense might be intentional killing in self-defense without reasonable grounds. And I suggest that if you properly name the doctrine, it loses much of its attractiveness. Finally, as a last reason why this, I think, is bad law, one should examine the facts in cases where the qualified defense is raised. For instance, and this is, this is just beautiful, the case of McKay in Australia, which is a leading case on which the Alberta Court of Appeal has relied. Um, the facts were that a poultry farm caretaker who had long been in pursuit of a chicken thief set an alarm, which one night the thief tripped. 
he was pursued by Mackay, who shot at him once with a rifle, whereupon the thief ran. He shot a second time, and the thief dropped the chickens and continued to run. He shot three more times, and one of those bullets at least fatally wounded the thief. McKay was heard to remark shortly thereafter, served him right, he was pinching fowls, and he added that he didn't care if he killed the thief or not. Now he changed his story later and said he only meant to wound him, which I still think means inflict grievous bodily harm, but absent provocation. Do you really think McKay was guilty of manslaughter only? If you do, you will receive Fraser and G more sympathetically than I. Um, there's a surprising similarity in some of these rather specious claims of self-defense, which the House of Lords have characterized as fanciful hypotheses. The Australian case of Howe and the Alberta case of Fraser fall right into the same kind of a basket. In both cases, the deceased made really rather mild homosexual advances towards the accused. The retaliation in both cases was severe and fatal. For instance, Mr. Fraser struck the homosexual over the head 28 times with a metal cane. That's quite a price to pay for goosing the accused. <laughs> there is, however, light on the horizon. The uh, G case is, I'm glad to say, on the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the British Columbia Court of Appeal, and it is in that court where this whole doctrine arose in Canada in a case called Barilla, which I won't go into, it's referred to in the material, but that very court had occasion again to consider this in a recent decision called Basarabis and Speck. Now, the facts in that case were that two ladies paid a social call on the deceased. The Crown theorized that they visit him for the purpose of robbing him and committing murder. The two ladies claimed in substantially conflicting stories that during the course of the social call, the deceased had become amorous in an assaultive way with Basarabbas, that Speck had stabbed him, not fatally, to prevent the assault, that the accused thereupon became angry like a wounded bear and in his subsequent actions threatened the lives of the two ladies. And during the ensuing melee, the deceased was fatally stabbed by Basarabbas. By agreement of counsel, the trial judge did not even charge on section 34.1, so it must be assumed that they intended when they killed him to cause at least grievous bodily harm. The trial judge charged the jury under section 34.2, under section 35, under sections 37.1 and 2. The British Columbia Court of Appeal, the home of this doctrine, as stated unanimously, if section 34.2 is applicable, the jury must acquit the accused if it has reasonable doubt that he caused the death under reasonable apprehension of death and that he believed on reasonable and probable grounds that he could not otherwise preserve himself from death. I ask you to note these words because this is, f flies flat in the face of the Alberta Court of Appeal. As the accused intended to cause death, Unnecessary force is an irrelevant factor. If the jury does not convict of murder, it must acquit. The question of some lesser verdict cannot arise. For the same reason, unnecessary force is an irrelevant factor in a consideration of section 35. There you have the British Columbia Court of Appeal saying it's irrelevant, doesn't bear consideration. The Alberta Court of Appeal and Fraser and G say the trial judge must tell the jury in those circumstances that if the accused believed he was doing something right, but uh, there's no basis for his belief. Still, it's manslaughter because it's less morally culpable. Well, I suggest that the British Columbia Court of Appeal is finally on the right track. And it will be interesting to see what the Supreme Court of Canada does. Um, if Fraser and G are adopted, better buy a handgun. I'll go to uh, another uh, topic now. I've spent probably more than half my time on that one issue. We'll get into the basket of things that have happened in the last five years that I hope will be of some use to you 
practical use when you're defending a client. Uh, under Section 27, one has the defense of justification. It's not very long. Everyone is justified in using as much force as is reasonably necessary to prevent the commission of an offense for which, if committed, the perpetrator could be arrested without warrant and uh, if the offense would be likely to cause immediate and serious injury to the person and property of anyone. In the decision of G, the Alberta Court of Appeal, and a portion of it that might be defensible, uh, judicially rewrote Section 27 by importing into Canadian uh, criminal law through Section 7, subsection 3, which preserves common law defenses, an old case of Regina versus Rose. I won't go into all the details, but suffice it to say that if that part of Regina and G is good law, then Section 27 now must be read exactly the same as Section 34.1 and 34.2. It has greatly broadened the scope of the defense that would otherwise be available under Section 27. That will probably also be dealt with in the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, but if you're faced with that situation, it's something to bear in mind. You have more latitude now until a case is overruled. At least it's arguable. Um, in that same defense, um, there is the right, sorry, under Section 37, this is the uh, section that authorizes one person to go to the defense of another as well as to his own defense. It says everyone is justified in using force to defend himself or anyone under his protection from assault if he uses no more force than is necessary to prevent the assault or the repetition of it. Subsection 2 provides that nothing in this section shall be deemed to justify the willful infliction of any hurt or mischief that is excessive having regard to the nature of the assault that the force used was intended to prevent. One of the interesting issues raised and very neatly ducked in Basarabas and Speck is what does this phrase under his protection mean? When is a person under your protection when you fly to his defense? Basarabas makes it quite plain that sections 34, 1 and 2 apply to self-defense only Section 35 applies to self-defense only, and it's only under Section 37 that you can justify using force to help another person. Under the code, that person must be under your protection. But um, in an article in the Criminal Law Review called The Killing Ground, 1964 to 1973, uh, the following statement appears as a statement of the common law. And if it's good common law, it may well be a defense in Canada. It is lawful to use force in the defense of another. In Chisholm, it was assumed that it was lawful to kill another in defense of a relative or a friend who was or was believed on reasonable grounds to be in imminent danger. And in another case called Duffy, and this is really the interesting one, it was recognized that it is lawful to use force in defense of a stranger, for there is a general liberty even as between strangers to prevent a felony. Well, if you see somebody committing an offense with relation to your friend, why is there any necessity that, or a person you don't even know, he's not under your protection, so you can't avail yourself of Section 37.1. These cases, and they have been adopted, that statement has been adopted once in Saskatchewan, I'll refer you to it later, uh, would suggest that if you're preventing a felony, it's open season. You can use reasonable force. I'll take a final parting shot at the case of G. Um, Justice Prouse in that decision was concerned about a jury instruction if the jury should accept the crown theory that the two individuals had gone to, to the deceased's apartment for the purpose of robbing him. If that were the case, then the issue would have to be decided not under Section 34, I think, but under Section 35, uh, which says that if you unlawfully assault someone else, but don't do it intending to cause death or grievous bodily harm, and if he retaliates and threatens you with death or grievous bodily harm, then la-di-da, you can defend yourself. Um, Justice Prouse 
went on in a lengthy dissertation of the common law to try to analyze what the charge to the jury would be, and he never even referred to Section 35. Um, I just put that up uh, for your consideration. I can't imagine why he wouldn't look at Section 35 unless they've decided to opt right out of the criminal code. Now, um, there is a decision today, and I will quote to you with my usual uh, vigor uh, from the Globe and Mail. The reason I do that is because I had had this case referred to in my paper, but it was just decided today by the Court of Appeal. I have not seen the decision. The issue in that case was an evidentiary issue, but is bang on self-defense. Uh, apparently, the accused was on trial before Mr. Justice Saunders. The issue in that case was self-defense, and the question was whether it was permissible to adduce evidence of the propensity of the deceased person for violence in circumstances where there was no evidence that the accused knew of this propensity. The notion of admitting that defense is, I suppose, by way of corroboration of the accused's posture that he was really in fear and was therefore genuinely defending himself. Of course, the evidence would be admissible if the accused knew of the reputation for violence, but when he didn't know of it, um, the evidence might tend to show that the accused is the kind of a person who, or the deceased was the kind of a person who was violent on one occasion, therefore he was violent on another occasion. And it smacks rather of putting the deceased person on trial in place of the accused. However, I have not seen the decision. I say to you, the Court of Appeal has now apparently decided that such evidence is admissible, even though your client, the accused, may not know of the reputation for violence of the person he kills. A couple of words about provocation. The Alberta Court of Appeal again in Fraser, Justice McDermott, dealing with the provocation, recognizes that it's a two-step process. First of all, there must be a wrongful act or insult of such a nature as to be sufficient to deprive an ordinary person of the power of self-control. And then there must be the actual acting by the accused in the heat of passion and before there was time for his passion to cool. Uh, McDermott, in his judgment, uh, suggested that on that first branch, whether a wrongful act or insult is sufficient to deprive a person of self-control, that the Court of Appeal was in every bit as good a position as the trial judge to make that determination. Um, he said it's an objective test, and if he had had his way with the appeal, he would have dismissed provocation on that basis on the theory that he did not consider the words um, were sufficient to be corroboration. The um, other two members of the court didn't expressly disagree, but they sent the matter back because the trial judge had wrongly instructed himself as to provocation. Uh, I'll just leave it to you for whatever it's worth. Another area of so-called self-defense is the area of correction of children or pupils by force under section 43 of the code. It provides Every school teacher or parent, person standing in loco parentis, is justified in using force by way of correction uh, to a pupil or child under his care if the force does not exceed what is reasonable in the circumstances. The Ontario Court of Appeal, in a case called Elford Og Moss, decided that um, where the victim of the assault was 22 years of age but was a resident of a regional center for the mentally retarded. He had a mental age of five. The accused was his residential counselor and as the Court of Appeal held, uh, had sort of the da daily care of this man, a care which they said extended to most respects. The victim spilled some milk. He got uh, wrapped on the head with a tablespoon five times. The uh, counselor was charged with common assault. The Court of Appeals said the respondent was not a school teacher. He was not standing in the place of a parent, or, uh, uh, and the complainant was neither a pupil or a child, and they found him guilty. Very interesting interpretation. Uh, there it is, and it's not much longer than that. Um, Judge Cadsby in a, of the provincial court had a case of Baptiste. The case is not exceptional for its facts. It's not worthy, really, of going into for that reason. But you can obtain a copy of it from the chief judge's office. 
and it is an excellent collection of principles and authorities dealing with this section, and should it ever arise. Finally, the Saskatchewan District Court, in a case called Can I, has ruled that where a teacher proposes to exercise the force authorized by Section 43, he must have objectively reasonable grounds to believe that the pupil has engaged in conduct deserving punishment. And if he doesn't have objectively reasonable grounds for his belief, then he has no defense under Section uh, 43. How are we doing for time? <coughs> All right. You want to you summarize? There is more in the paper dealing with defense of real property, dealing with, what are the headings here? Uh, accused who is prisoner in jail. I have one under humor and ingenuity. It's a Saskatchewan Supreme Court decision that just breaks me up every time I read it. And I will, um, I'll leave you with one more because I think it's very useful on a day-to-day -day basis and I'll trespass this far. The last thing, common assault. Prosecutors constantly argue to me that the definition of common assault in section 244 is complete. They say if you apply force without consent, Intentionally, you've committed an assault. And I say that's bunk. Uh, Halsbury defines assault as intentional application of force in an angry or hostile manner, or in an angry, rude, revengeful, or violent manner. The case that I would refer you to, there are two of them. The more recent is decided in 1859. <laughs> It has been adopted in Canada by this court. Uh, in that case, the facts are interesting because the accused uh, was watching a fire and the complainant was a uh, fireman. He was spraying water on the fire. The uh, passerby said, hey, uh, don't you see you're spreading the flames? Uh, pump on the next house. The fireman told the passerby something that wasn't too polite and then the passerby went up and tapped the fireman on the shoulder and said, hey, come on, put it on the next house. Um, the fireman gave the man into the custody of a constable for assaulting him, and there was a subsequent suit for false arrest and imprisonment. The uh, court, and this is a very high court, it was a rule nisi that was discharged, so it's equivalent to the English Court of Appeal, uh, said that um, the mere laying on of hands in every case is not a battery, for the party's intentions must be considered. People will sometimes, by way of a joke or in friendship, clap a man on the back. It would be ridiculous to say that in every case uh, the man has no authority. Now, the question of hostile intent can often get you out of a box where you look like you're right in on Section 244. The case was brought to my attention by Colin Campbell in a union dispute case where... Um, the employee was a professional agitator, no doubt about it. He had asked for leave from employment on 15 occasions, and on the 16th occasion, he was refused. He grieved, and he got his way. And the manager went down to tell him, look, Joe, you got your leave. You can go. You can take the day off and do something. Not satisfied with that, the employee then badgered the manager all across the floor, say, come on, I demand an apology. You stop right here and apologize. And the the manager finally stopped and he took the guy by the shoulder and he turned him around, intentional application of force without consent, and said, Joe, go back to work. Now, under Section 244, if that's the complete definition of assault, the man's guilty. Uh, I applied coward and badly and dismissed the charge with costs. <laughs>